Praise God. Well, today, uh, we are, it is Baptism Sunday, and, uh, you know, we haven't taught on baptism itself and uh, its significance for a while, so I um, felt impressed to go ahead and do that. You know, we have a number of individuals that are being baptized in water today, salt water. We're going to do it in the ocean uh, today, and... Um, you know, we say, well, as long as it's not thunderstorming when, when it happens, as long as the, the rain tapers off, you're going to get wet anyway. So what does it matter if it's wet? And it's, you know, looking like it's tapering off early afternoon, so we're all set. So we're having a baptism service. Um, but I just want to go over and, and teach on this, you know, what is the significance of water baptism? Why do we baptize people? What does it make you a better person? You know, and hopefully we'll, uh, and we will, we'll, we'll go over some of these things today. So water baptism, number one, is that it's an ordinance of the church. It's an ordinance of the church. An ordinance is an outward rite or symbolic observance com- commanded by Jesus Christ, with, which sets forth essential Christian truths. I'll read that again. An ordinance is an outward rite or symbolic observance commanded by Jesus Christ, which sets forth essential Christian truths. So water baptism is an ordinance. You know, it's not something we do just to do, because it, it is, there's, there's purpose in it. Jesus set the example of water baptism by being baptized by John the Baptist. Let's look at Matthew 3.13. So we're going to look at a number of scriptures. Of course, but, you know, concerning this, and look at what the Bible has to say. Matthew 3.13 says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him, and, and John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So even though John the Baptist was saying, Wait a minute, you're the Christ. I need to be baptized by you. Jesus submitted himself, saying, We need need to do this. John was sent ahead of Jesus. To proclaim his coming and so Jesus submitted himself to be baptized Jesus made it clear that bapti- that believers were to be baptized in the Great Commission let's look at Matthew 28 verse 19 now when you're reading when you see baptize a baptize is not just every time you see baptize in Scripture it doesn't ha- have to do necessarily with water baptize um, is a transliteration from Greek that actually means to dunk. So they didn't translate. In other words, baptize is not a translated word. It's a word that sounds like what it came from originally. You know, in the Greek, it's like baptismo or something. It, it, it sounds like the same thing, and they just left it. And um, then it, people think it's this religious term. It means to dunk, you know, like... If you were dunking a cookie in milk or something, that's, that's baptized. You're baptizing your cookie. <laughs> People say, oh, that's sacrilegious. No, that's what the word means. If, if, if we were to be more literal, the word, you know, the Bible would just say they were dunked. But it doesn't always talk about water baptism. Water baptism, as we're going to see, it's, it's a type, it's, it's a symbol of what's happening in the spirit. So every time you see baptism, it's not talking literally necessarily about water, but water baptism is a symbol and it um, goes right along uh, with baptizing into, when you, when you say you're baptized into, um, well, we'll read some different scriptures, but like when you're baptized into the kingdom of God, you, you are immersed, you become in the family. It's not, it's not just a religious term. But let's look at Matthew 28, verse 19. It says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. 
So yes, you're to go to, and we'll see water bap. The, the early church did do water bapti- baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It says, teaching them to observe all things that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In Mark 16, 14, it says, And then he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Now we'll read, we're going to read a number of scriptures. You know, I had a, a friend one time in college you know, he, he was like, well, this says you have to be baptized to be saved. No, you gotta re, you got to take the whole scripture. It says, he that doesn't believe will be condemned. It's the believing that does something. The baptizing is an outward symbol of what goes on, and we'll see that. you got to take the whole of scripture together. So Peter repeated the command to be baptized on the day of, of Pentecost. So we're talking about why is this an ordinance of the church? Let's look at Acts 2, verse 38. So, Jesus was baptized. He said, be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Peter reiterated that. It says, then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 41, then those who received his word were baptized... And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them, added to the church. So you see here in the early church, they did the same thing. The apostles baptized converts throughout the book of Acts. So let's look at Acts 8, verse 12. Acts 8, verse 12 It says, when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. So notice, they believed Philip as he preached, and then they were baptized. Verse 13, then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip. So you can see, this is literally talking about being baptized. I mean, it indicates it's with water. Because it says, when he was baptized, he continued with Philip, indicating it was something physical. And he was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. In Acts 10, 46, this is um, at Cornelius' house. And if you know the story, um, you know, uh, Peter saw a vision. He was uh, praying and he saw a vision and... Uh, saw some men coming to his house, and the Spirit said, go, go with these men. And at the same time, this man Cornelius, who was a devout person, devout man, but was, he was a Jewish person, or a Gentile person, but wasn't, um, he wasn't a Christian, and he sought to, to send people to Peter's house. So it was very supernatural how this happened. He sent for Peter. Peter knew he was coming. The, the Lord had told him, go with them. And so... He goes with them, and he's preaching to Gentiles, which up to that point, the church was all Jewish. There were no Gentiles, so this was foreign. This is the very early church. This is, how is this, how how can this be? The the early, uh, the apostles originally, they had the idea, the understanding that this was just going to be for the Jewish people. And so God had to supernaturally, you know, get through to Peter to go and, uh, this is for everybody. So he went and preached. And that's what's going on. He's been preaching to Cornelius' household. Cornelius gathered all his household, was ready to hear the word of God, whatever Peter said. And so that's what is going on. Peter's preaching to this household. And then in verse 46, Acts 10, 46, it says, For they heard them... Okay, so he's preached the word. They've received it. Verse 46, For they heard him speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So they they were born again and they were filled with the Holy Spirit because they were speaking with other tongues there. And then Peter says, can anyone forbid water? He's talking about water water baptizing. Seeing these, or that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. In other words, they've been born again, they've received the Holy Spirit. Shouldn't they be baptized? 
Verse 48, And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked them to stay for a few days. So you see that's, that Jesus was baptized. He said, go, baptize, go preaching the word, baptizing people. You see Peter said the same thing. You say a number of, of times that um, throughout, the God, throughout the Acts that other people were baptized. Let's look at one more. Acts 8.36 now, as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch uh, said, What hinders me from being baptized? So, the back story here, Philip um, runs up to this chariot, and he, he sees this person, this eunuch, reading uh, the, the Old Testament book of Isaiah, and he, he's, he doesn't know what he's reading, and Philip starts preaching from that point Jesus to him. And so the man believes, and he becomes born again. And so then we pick up in verse 36. It says, Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Verse 37, Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And then he answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Verse 38, so he commanded that the chariot should stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Verse 39, and then when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. So he came out of the water, so he's baptized, and when he came up out of the water... The Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so they didn't see Philip anymore. That's interesting, isn't it? He's gone. Phil, no, eunuch, just go ahead. He didn't see him anymore. <laughs> He's translated. But he said he went on his way rejoicing. So the eunuch's praising God. But notice he was baptized here. So the spiritual significance of baptism is taught in the epistles as well. So we see Jesus, we see uh, Great Commission, we see Peter saying it, we see it. There's examples here, and then it's also taught in the epistles, and we're going we're gonna to talk more about that in a little bit. But water baptism does not save you. Water baptism does not save you. There's a story on a, a cold January day down in Tennessee. A church was having a baptism in the river, January. Of course, it's in Tennessee, but still. <laughs> the preacher said to the one, uh, the one man after he had come up from being baptized, is the water cold? And the guy goes, nah. And one of the deacons shouted, dip him again, preacher. He's still lying. <laughs> but baptism is not going to change your behavior. So, that, you know, this is a joke, but... Some people think you're baptized, now you're going to be completely different. That's not baptism. Baptism doesn't change you. We don't believe that water baptism saves a person, transforms him from spiritual death to spiritual life, or changes his behavior. Baptism does none of those things. We are saved by our faith in what Jesus did for us, not in anything we do ourselves, including being baptized. That is just something you do externally. If, if, you, if we say baptism saves you, what other things save you? What do you got to do now? No, baptism is just an, it's just an act. That doesn't save you. We are saved by our faith in what Jesus did for us, not in anything we could do for ourselves. Let's look at Romans 3, verse 27. See, there's a lot, baptism, I don't know if you realize this, but minor wars have been fought over baptism and how you baptize people. Do you sprinkle them? Do you throw the water at them? Do you dunk them? I mean, they're, really, and then pe some people are like, you've got to be baptized to be saved. We've got to look at the whole of Scripture. That's not true. You don't, you're not saved by baptism, but baptism is something that is an ordinance and that we can participate in. 
Romans 3.27 says, Where is boasting then? Is It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. So what it's saying, where, where's boasting? What are you going to boast? You know, well, I do this, so therefore I'm holier. Or I did this, so therefore I'm saved. See, it says that's excluded. By what law? Of works? No, by the law of faith. In other words, we believe God that's how we come to him. It's not by what we do. Galatians 2 verse 16 says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Justified means acquitted. Justified means declared righteous. That you will not be acquitted, declared righteous by works. It's by faith. In other words, you believe what Jesus did. That what, that's what makes you right, not by doing something. And this is so important because if, it, if this, th there's a continuum, people will fall in one of the most dangerous things. I don't know if I want to say it that way. What, one of the most, uh, the easiest things for a Christian to fall into is to start living by works instead of by grace and, and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Are we supposed to do good works? Yes, the scripture tells us that we ought to continue in good works, but the good works are what's, what uh, one person said, they're a fruit of being saved. They're not a root. In other words, you don't do things to get saved. You do things, good works, because you're saved. And that is so important. Because if you fall, or I fall, or any Christian falls into thinking that you have to do things to earn position with God, that will crush you in a hurry. Now, you have to keep separate the things that are yours by relationship in the family, and then certain benefits and... and uh, rewards that happen because of your service to him over time. They're, those are two different things. In other words, are there benefits to serving God long term? Are there benefits? Are there going to be rewards in heaven? The Bible talks about that over and over. But do, does you serving God get you a place in the family? No. You're in the family because of the Lord Jesus Christ, and there are rights and privileges that go with that. Because you're in the family. Now that you're in the family, we have a choice. Are we going to serve and go fully on with him, or are we going to sit on the sidelines? You're still in the family. You still Healing belongs to you. Uh, you know, peace belongs to you. Help, strength belongs to us. And if we think we have to do something now to get those things we'll get into the position where we don't feel like we're doing enough so we can't get it so now it'll just it'll it'll crush you does that mean it doesn't matter how we live at all <laughs> no it absolutely does matter we know that how we live will determine where we go and what happens in life but that's not to be confused with what's ours because of what Jesus did so we can't we don't earn our way into the family it is only by faith in the Lord Jesus, not by works. But when we're saved and we're born again, now we say, hallelujah, God has saved me. What can I do to help? What can I do to worship Him and save Him? And you do things, good works we call them, we would say serving God because you are saved, not to get saved. These are two different things. And if we ever get them confused, then we start working to try to get things that are already ours. But you can't work to receive what Jesus already purchased for you. 
Let's read Galatians 2.16 again. It says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Let's look at Romans 8, or 10, verse 8. <clears throat> Romans 10, verse 8, it says, What does it say? The word is in you, or word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Notice verse 9. And we'll read 10 again. Let me go back to verse 9. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. That's how you're born again. You believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth. What are you confessing? Jesus is Lord. What are you believing? That God has raised Him from the dead for you. It says you will be saved. Notice it says, it doesn't say and, and start listing a bunch of other stuff, including baptism. Verse 10, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So it's with the heart you believe, and you confess unto salvation. Let's look back at Acts, 10, or Acts 8, 36, in the, where we read the eunuch was baptized. Notice, he said, what hinders me from being baptized? And then Philip said in verse 37, if you believe with all your heart, you may. That's the important part. If you believe, you can be baptized. It's the same now. You don't just go be baptized because you feel like taking a swim and, oh, that looks cool. Let's go. I want to go swimming too. What are we doing today later in the, in the day? Most people are going, no, I don't want to go swimming. That water's probably cold. <laughs> but, you know, it's not something we just do. Well, I want to be baptized. That looks neat. I feel like I would like to add that to my resume, baptized, you know, in the Atlantic Ocean. That sounds awesome. Count me in. Why would you be baptized? What's the prerequisite for you being baptized? You believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, and you've made the confession that Jesus is Lord, and he is your Lord. That, that is what... You are doing, when you're being baptized, you're identifying with Him. There is not any real price. I mean, okay, well today, it's cold, so that's a price that some of you that are being baptized with, you need to be geared for, you know, I don't know how cold, I mean, I know temperature-wise, but yeah, how, how, what the actual temperature of the water is. It's not, you know like probably your bathtub at home, real, real, real warm. But there's a price here you could say, man, I'm laying my life down here. I'm going to go baptize. I don't care if it's cold or what. I'm going to do it. Okay, there's that. But in America, there's not really a price, you know, for identifying publicly with the Lord Jesus. In other words, on that beach today, there are not going to be people watching to see who's baptized and, oh, they're baptized, so they're marked. We need to take them out. I can't believe they identified publicly with the Lord Jesus. But that's not the same in all the world. I know of a man, uh, and we heard his personal testimony. He was, he was born uh, Islam. He's a Muslim or in the Islamic faith. And his testimony is awesome. But, and he preaches in... in uh, the word all over. But when he gives his testimony, he was born again over, I forget which, uh, which country. But it was, you know, they're all 
uh, it was all Islamic, it was all Muslims. And for him to do that meant he was turning his back. For him to be born again meant him, he was turning his back on his family and his whole culture. And then for somebody to baptize him, he couldn't find anybody that would baptize him. And what he realized is that for somebody, I mean initially, for somebody to baptize him publicly put a death sentence on that person. And finally this, person, this pastor said he saw, he recognized on this young man the call of God and that he was sincere and he said, I'll baptize you. And they went out publicly and this man baptized him and it wasn't long after that they got this man out of the, 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 the young man out of the country, but the pastor was killed. And that's part of his testimony. He says, I preached the gospel. And he gave the reasons why he preached the gospel. And, and of course, it's, it's all founded on what Jesus did for him. And it's awesome when you hear him talk. But he said, and he gave, gives the man that, that died, he said, another reason I preached the gospel, and he names the man, and he gives the his story and he said he laid down his life for me he goes how could I stop and say I, I can't do it he said he, he had children he had a wife and he laid down his life and he said that's the reason I preach the gospel and then he goes on and ties it with Jesus Jesus laid down his life for us and how can we not do what he asked us to do but my point is when that man baptized him there was he was counting the cost he knew very well, this could cost me my life. That's not the case here. And I'm not saying we can't be a believe this is where this person was and what he was believing, and I'm not saying. If we are where we are and in, in, in walking in, in God's will for our life, I do not believe our life can be taken from us. You can lay down your life. And people have done that, and it talks about that in the Bible. Some chose to lay down their life for a greater, I can't remember how it says it now offhand, but there's a difference between laying down your life and just having it taken from you. I don't know where this man was, you know, faith-wise or whatever, but he, he willingly did that, and uh, that's not for me to judge. So we never have to be in fear. And I just say that to sew that up. You know, you don't have to be in fear. Somebody's going to take you out. My point is, he lay, there was a cost. Publicly identifying with Christ, there was a cost. Today, we are, pub, we are doing the exact same thing, but there, there's not really any cost to do it. It is a symbol that we are identifying with the Lord Jesus Christ. While we're on this, I feel like I, I should touch on this. Um, you know, people, so then if, if it's just a symbol, you know, there are people that believe. Um, well, what about kids then? You know, and the, the, there are denominations that'll sprinkle kids, babies, I guess, so that um, if they would die, they would go to heaven. Children are born right with God. With everything we see in the scripture, their spirit is new when they come down, when they, they're born. We see everything that we've read. How do you become born again? By believing and confessing. A baby can't do that. A baby can't comprehend. Everything we've just read about how are you born again. There's no child, uh, you know, and this is what we'll touch on in a moment, but uh, certainly an infant cannot do that. How are you born again? We by believing what the Lord that the, the Lord Jesus rose from the dead and confess with your mouth. They can't do that. So if we baptize them, what, what does that do? Nothing. That's a man's creation. With everything that we can see in the Word of God, and the Word of God doesn't go, you know, 
talk specifically about stuff, but if you, if you have to, I, you have to um, interpret Scripture with Scripture. And one thing that indicates this, Romans 7, verse 7, look at, read this. You know, since we're touching on baptism, we'll touch on this, because this is a question sometimes people have, and it's important when you say, well, what is it? Well, it's not, it doesn't save us. The baptism does not save us. And, and the, the, if we think it does somehow, then we have the wrong understanding of baptism. We need to understand that it's a symbol, that it is an outward symbol of what's happened on the inside of our identification with the Lord Jesus. And we'll read some more scripture to that. But look at this scripture. It's interesting. Romans 7, verse 7. This is the Apostle Paul. He says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, You shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and it killed me. Therefore the law is holy and the commandment holy, just, and good. Now go back to verse 8. Sin taking opportunity by the commandment produced in me all manner of evil desire, for apart from the law, sin was dead. So the commandment came. Verse 9, I, I was alive once without the law. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Well, I'm pretty sure when Paul's writing this or having it dictated, he's alive. Look at verse 9. I was alive once without the law. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. Is he talking about physically? Well, who's talking right now then? If, if, he was saying, I, if he was saying I died physically, then who's dictating right now? No, he's not, talk, he's not saying I died, but yeah, but I'm here. No, he's saying I, he's talking about spiritually. And he said, in the commandment which was to bring life, I frowned to bring death. And you, if you look at Scripture, it, it's saying we are to come to the Lord with the knowledge of the Lord Jesus, come, believe on what he did, and confess. Paul's saying here, I was alive once, but when the commandment came, when I understood what is saying, sin revived, I did not obey, and I died. Which means, to die, you had to be alive. So with all indication, children, you can't be dogmatic. But just, to, you know, when we're talking about these things, people are like, well, what about? Okay, well, as best we can tell from the Scripture. You know, you don't have 18 verses all on specific this thing, but you, you look at the, the, the whole of Scripture and look at what it says and doesn't say, and then look at verses like this. How could a baby come to earth dead spiritually? They just were created. The spiritually, their, their body. What, what if they died in the womb? What happened? Did they have any chance to become born again? So then if they get out of the womb and we sprinkle them, all of a sudden that makes them good? They're good. Until what? That doesn't, that doesn't line up with the Bible. I know people teach it. See, children are alive to God. There was a... Um, Brother Hagen shared a... a, uh, a, a story, an account. I believe this was a minister... And his, his, he had young children in the car, and he was going to go on a trip. And uh, the, his wife was driving them to the airport. And so it was him, his wife, and a couple small children. And there was a young boy 
early, maybe four or five, maybe six, something like that. And they were going, uh, they went to the airport really early, and so the kids were sleeping. And then he got, I think it might even been a charter plane or maybe it was a uh, commercial. But they had dropped him off. Of course, this is years, you know, stuff's a lot different then. Dropped him off, and his flight was taking off. And they had stayed there, and the, the wife was in the car, and the kids were in the back seat. And they were sleeping because it was early in the morning. And all of a sudden, the, the airplane's taken off, and the boy wakes up and looks, and he says, Mommy, Mommy, Daddy isn't on that plane, is he? And he said, well, yeah, son, you know he's leaving. He said, doesn't he know that that plane's going to crash into the mountain? That mountain? And right after that, it crashed into the mountain. See, children are alive. Their spirits are alive to God. When they grow, you hear about kids, they, they, they see stuff in the spiritual realm sometimes. What they, they're seeing things. They are alive. They haven't died. Brother Hagen talks about it himself. He said... Um, when he was young, when he was growing up, he said he knew that he was, he could already sense the call of God. He wouldn't have articulated like this, but he could, he, artic, he, he would say, I'm, uh, when people would ask him what he's going to do when he grows up, he said, I a peacha. <laughs> I a peacha. What he's trying to say is I'm a preacher. And he said he would go out into the, his garden, to his you know, mom's garden and, and grandma's garden, he would preach to the cabbage heads and, you know, preach to the different vegetables. And he knew. He, he had, he, I'm going to be a peacher. I a peacher. But he said as he went on, at, at one point, that left. That went away. Reached a point where no, he's going to do something else. And he said that didn't come back until when he got born again, and I'm not going to go into all his story. He was on the bed of sickness, and he got born again. And when he got born again, for real, the first thing that came back to him is, I'm supposed to preach the gospel. See, he was back alive. And when some people call, talk about this, there's a term for it called the age of accountability. Now, we don't have, and we're not going to try to get into this in depth. We're just touching on it because we talk about baptism. People have all kinds of ideas about it. And sometimes these are, these are questions. We don't have all the answers, but we can look at the Word of God and have the best, you know, look at what the Word of God says. That, that word, that term isn't in the Bible. But what, that, what you mean by that is the, the child is born alive. But at some point when they understand right and wrong and they understand what they're doing, comprehend and make a conscious decision, no, I won't do it and eternally. How do, you how do you know exactly when that would be? You don't, but God does. And some, some kids that maybe they're mentally deficient or they have a problem may never reach it. They don't ever reach that, that age where you, know, you can see somebody in their 20s or 30s just never develop mentally. They're, they're like a two-year-old. Say, so, well, what would happen to per that person? They never, they're alive to God. They, but at some point, like what the Apostle Paul was talking about, I was alive once without the law, but the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. Something went away. You need to be born again. And when you see kids that have just grown up around it, you know, it's almost like twilight. At some point, they, they're hearing it, they believe it, and they act on it. It's almost like the, the, it doesn't like they have to go, be it their long period of time, and then suddenly they're born again. It's just, they can call on the name of Jesus, and it's almost like they, they just keep going. That's why it is so important that we share the gospel with children. So, so important. Let's keep moving. Water baptism is a symbol. So it doesn't save us. It is not, uh, it is not a work that saves us. So, you know, we are relating it to children. People are like, well, I got to get my child on the, on the way home from the hospital. What happens if they get in a car crash before we get them baptized? They're going to be with Jesus. So don't be afraid. See, that is fear, and that is looking at an outward work, and that has bound people. And they're thinking, and at the same time, giving people a false sense of comfort. 
Well, I was baptized when I was, you know, whatever, two weeks old, and, you know, I'm 42, and I'm good. Or, you know, I had it confirmed later, but let's say I'm 10, 11, living all over the place. It, 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 baptism doesn't save us. It doesn't make us right with God. Water baptism is an outward symbol of an inward work. Look at 1 Peter 3, verse 21. 1 Peter 3, verse 21. There is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism, not the removal of the flesh or the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward, conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, it's not the removal of the filth. It's, it's making very clear. It's not taking a bath. It's not dunking. That's not what does it. Look at it at the Amplified. makes it very clear. It's a good sum up of baptism. 1 Peter 3.21 Amplified Classic. And baptism, which is a figure of their deliverance, does, not, does now also save you from inward questionings and fears, not by the removing of the outward body filth, bathing, but by providing you with the answer of a good and clear conscience, inward cleanness and peace before God, because you are demonstrating what you believe to be yours through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's not the outward, it's that you're demonstrating what is yours through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The symbolism of water baptism can be simply stated as an outward demonstration of an inward regeneration or an outward testimony of one's inward faith. See, it's something outward that describes or that represents something inward. I use this example many times. This wedding ring represents the fact that I am married to Shelley. But this wedding ring does not make me married to Shelley. I could take this off, not wear it, and I would still be married to Shelley. At the same time, I could have put one on before I was married to Shelley, and that did not make me married to Shelley. Very specific. I know the day, May 1st, 1999, when we were married before God, and since that day, ring, no, I, mean, I, I believe in wearing a ring. I think it's good. It's telling everybody else that doesn't know you, I'm married, taken. But it doesn't matter if, <laughs> doesn't matter the chain, and the same thing with her, right? It, it doesn't matter what type of ring you have. Doesn't matter if you upgrade your ring. Doesn't matter if you lose your ring and got to replace it. Doesn't matter if you downgrade your ring. It, it, it doesn't have any bearing on being married, right? Same thing with water baptism. You can go get dunked. If you haven't been born again, not doing you any good. On the other hand, you can be born again. If you didn't get baptized, it's a good thing, but it does not mean you're not saved. So this is a symbol then of what is happening. It's a beautiful representation of what we are doing when we're uh, identifying with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Let's look at a, a few scriptures in relation to this. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. <clears throat> it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Romans 6, verse 1 says, What shall we say then? What shall, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus, you were immersed in Him, we're baptized into his death. So you're baptized, it, it corresponds to him dying. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. 
that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Colossians 2, verse 11. It says, In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Verse 12, Buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God and raised and who raised him from the dead. See all these things talking about we're, bat, we're, we're buried with him, baptized with him, and then raised with him. One more, Ephesians 2, verse 4. It says, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Summing up everything we've said, showing if you go back to verse 5, when we were dead in trespasses, so we're dead in trespasses, that's like you being Beneath the water, you're death. You're in, in death. By grace you have been saved, verse 6, and raised us up together, and he made us sit together in the heavenly places. So we were dead, buried, and then with Christ, we're identified with Christ. When he was raised, we were raised. And when we come out of that water, it's representing that you're a new person. It's representing what happened in the spirit. It's just showing in the natural. And that's what's going to happen this afternoon. When you see people go down, they're, they're representing that they died with Christ. They were identified with Christ as the Lord Jesus was crucified. But as he was raised, we're raised with him, and now we walk in newness of life. We're a new creature, we're alive to God, we're in the family of God, and this gives us a visual representation of what has already happened in the Spirit. Amen? Amen? It's a beautiful thing. It's a powerful thing when you understand what's going on. But it doesn't save us. It doesn't mean that when, I mean, if you're hoping... Hey, my spouse or my significant other or somebody in my family, man, I can't wait till they get baptized because I'm getting a new husband, new wife, new child. When they come up out of that water, they're all new. They're going to change. They're going to be talking different, walking different, behaving different. No, if you're expecting that, you're going to be disappointed. It is a representation of what has happened, but it doesn't change them. It didn't save them. It doesn't do anything in the spiritual. It represents the spiritual, but we can rejoice in the truth that it represents and look back and say, yep, I've identified with him publicly and thank God for what he did. Amen.